Is it important to understand the mechanisms? Because you've already alluded to the fact that we don't quite know why exactly it works. Is it changing the fascicle length? Is it like what you just said? Is it just a strength thing? Is it just developing your ability to absorb load? Is it a combination of both factors? Is understanding the mechanisms important? Does that matter? And does that drive future direction? It's for, well, it's important for us, for the researchers, right? Because it helps us to shape where we go next and it helps us to add more evidence about how the why question is really interesting, right? So the why question will always be really interesting. Um, and there's, there's so many components to this that, that could potentially contribute. I, I'm not sure if we're able to, to, to um, effectively unravel all of them. So whether there's a, a neuromuscular, and I, I, I use that phrase carefully, um, uh, control element, whether there's a morphological change, and maybe strength is just a proxy for all of them. So if you just measure their strength and they're getting stronger, that's fine. Um, but for the athletes, I think it matters little. For the athletes, it's really important that their performance is, is as, as good as it can be. And I think our job is to actually protect that performance. That, that's really where I see us coming in. And so um, if we're trying to do that, then this is you know, potentially one exercise that, that might actually help to, to do that. So the why question remains an interesting one, I think. But I think it's important that we don't get lost in those details, that we, that we ultimately just try and remember what the clinical utility of this exercise represents. Clinically, do you have any thoughts on incorporating that movement or maybe or similar type movements before a, a practice or a training or maybe a weightlifting session or, or a field practice or after those things? So, so if we if we th if we stick to hamstring injuries or hamstrings, right? There's uh, Matt Bourne, um, who's at uh, Griffin University um, uh, in the on the Gold Coast. Now, he did a study looking at exercise selection, and so he looked at deadlifts, Nordics, hip extension exercises, single leg bridges, the whole the whole shebang. And so, the two most prominent exercises were Nordics. So Nordics gives you the greatest muscle activation, medial and lateral hamstrings. The hip extension exercise prefer, preferentially activates your lateral, so your biceps femoris, more. So if, you're, if you want to target your biceps femoris muscle, you, you preferentially, so you feel there's an activation issue between the different muscle groups, then the hip extension exercise is, is the way to go. Um, but you're still going to get more activation with Nordics apart from high-speed running. So high-speed running is the one thing that will still give you the greatest muscle activation. So I would say, and, and um, there's, uh, there's, there's groups now that are really looking into the mechanics of sprinting as well, but I think just before that, just including high-speed running is essential uh, if, you're, if you're involved in a sport where you have to perform <laughs> high-speed running or sprinting and change of direction even um, during that. So I think that... That to me is something that that I'm sure I would argue that most 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 uh, most of the teams are incorporating these components now um, as part of their their general training during the week. Whether it, whether we should do it every day, once a week, uh, a couple of sprints before you start training, I, I'm not sure. But they, it definitely should be part of your training. Um, and, and as I said, I, I would work really hard with the athletic trainers, with the strength conditioning coaches to make sure this all fits in with the overall plan for the athlete or the team. 